let's spend some time talking about potassium. Let's talk about ta potassium in the context of a case. This is a fictional case of a 75-year-old male who is currently working, who comes in for an elective surgical procedure. Post-op, the patient develops atrial fibrillation, complicated by a cerebral vascular accident, stroke, which is complicated by airway protection issues. The patient develops a pneumonia and ends up on mechanical ventilation and ends up in the intensive care unit. Thinking about this particular case, we review the patient's preoperative electrolyte panel and what we notice is that preoperatively the patient's potassium is 4.3 and postoperatively, we notice the patient's electrolyte profile is a complete mess, but one thing we do notice is the patient's potassium is 5.4. So we're going to think about this particular patient's potassium issues in the context of the case. What I wanted to do was split up this electrolyte profile into small pieces so it can be digested on a single talk by single talk basis. So we're going to focus on the potassium. When you think about potassium and you think about hyperkalemia, you think about high potassium, the, the kidney is going to try to keep the potassium in an extremely normal ra narrow range, 3.5 to 4.5 milliequivalents per liter. And the reason for that are there are cell processes and action potentials, etc., that depend on a very narrow range of potassium for proper functioning. Where do we get potassium? in our diet. How much potassium do we take in? We take in 100 to 200 milli equivalents per day, which seems like an awful lot considering that we won't give more than 10 milli equivalents of potassium per hour intravenously to a particular patient. Now, sources of potassium include the diet, but also include other endogenous and exogenous sources. So in terms of the diet, what are some foods that contain high potassium? Something like orange juice or tomato juice um, or tomato sauce. Those are intracellular foods. Banana is one of those things that people always think about. What's interesting about banana is it depends on how much banana, of course, that you eat. A standard banana is about 10 mil equivalents. So eat 10 bananas and you've got your potassium intake for the whole day. So diet is an important factor. Other important factors include transfusion, because if you think about it, not all of the cells that are transfused are intact, and potassium is an intracellular electrolyte. And so any cellular material like orange juice, tomato juice, etc. will have potassium, high concentrations of potassium, transfusions as well. And then also you have to think of the endogenous sources. So endogenous would be things like tissue breakdown, tumor lysis syndrome, etc. So when you have a patient who has high potassium, so K greater than 5.5, just as an example, the most important thing is to think about what the particular source could be. So the source is important and also whether or not the patient has kidney function. Because the main way that we eliminate potassium is through the urine. So the kidney function is going to be extremely important. Now what are ways that we can eliminate Potassium. Let's say that we have a potassium of 5.5 and we want to eliminate potassium. I'm not talking about temporizing the situation. I'm talking about elimination. So how do we eliminate There are a few ways. Number one, we can use a diuretic that wastes potassium, such as something like Lasix. So Lasix will waste potassium. It'll put potassium in the urine. So it increases 
urine, potassium, which is great if the patient's kidneys work. And so you can use Lasix to get rid of an elevated potassium. Number two, we can use something like k -exalate. And how does k work? k works by binding k in the colon. So if you have a patient without a colon, k is not going to work. k is not going to work very well if you have a patient who's post-op or a patient who has had surgery on the bowel. Those are indications where you do not want to use k -exalate. So k works as a sodium potassium exchange. The other way to definitively remove is by dialysis. And dialysis, of course, is not a benign procedure because it involves central venous access. However, dialysis removes potassium through diffusion. Here's your blood. Let's say our K is 8. And here's our dialysate. And the K in the dialysate is 2. So what happens is K leaves the blood, goes into the dialysate, and with the dialysis machine, we will basically take that potassium and dump it down the drain. And those are definitive ways to remove potassium. Note that insulin, calcium, do not remove potassium. Calcium protects the myocardium. Insulin will shift potassium intracellular, but you will only have about a 30-minute window where you have a relative decrease in your potassium concentration. So if you are going to eliminate potassium, most important thing is to determine whether or not you have kidney function, because if you do, you can use a diuretic. Otherwise, you may be, you may be forced to use k or something like dialysis. If you have a patient with hyperkalemia, high potassium, very important strategy is to decrease the amount of potassium that the patient's taking. So please, by all means, put the patient on a renal diet. A renal diet is a low potassium intake situation, low potassium diet. Okay, these are some strategies that may help you in terms of thinking about patients who have hyperkalemia.